Sorry, I should have I should have given everyone a trigger warning. You're going to see the breaking down okay, of a massive tuna. We use the chicks, there's a little bit of blood. Because we use, there's meat in the chicks, so we use the chicks. But the head, we scratch all the meat around it. It's actually fascinating. Let me get the link for this and share it with everybody. Okay. So I cut the one side of the head, now I'm going to cut the other side of the head. Remove the head first. We, we won't go through the whole thing. It's, 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 uh, the link is in the chat. Look at the size. This well, is a small. The, the, the meat in there. Look at all the meat inside the head. The belly is the best meat of the tuna. So that's where the toro is. That's where the beautiful part, the best part of the meat comes from right there. The toro side, the belly side. You see the line there? That's the line that you follow. Uh, the, how much they paid for that fish? It was many thousands of dollars. I don't remember exactly how much. All right, and we'll, we'll stop here. Just it's, it's an amazing dissection of the animal. He had the sharpest knife. Look at the way the knife slices through the body. The quality of that fish. And this is uh, probably the best sushi place in, 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 in Montreal, if not Canada. All right, everyone can go watch the rest of that afterwards. Um, see, we don't always have to start. Look at the beautiful piece of meat. And his, his tools behind him. Oh, my goodness. All right. That's Park Restaurant in Montreal. Uh, Antonio Park, Chef Park, when I was a lawyer, was, a, was my client. My, my, I'd not say my favorite client. Some were, you know, you, you don't compare clients like you don't compare children. Some files you don't like quite as much. Uh, Chef was one of my favorite clients and makes the best damn sushi on earth. Um, and it's apropos, well, look, I, I'm starting with that instead of starting with the, the latest Twitter fight that I've gotten into. I'll do that tomorrow when we don't have another world-renowned, you know, salivate-type uh, inducing, saliva, saliva, <laughs> salivation-inducing chefs, Chef Andrew Grohl. If you don't know who he is, you'll know now. I think a lot of us were in the same political sphere. I guess we call it the red pill, uh, the red pill sphere of the interwebs. I think a lot of you watching now know who Chef Gruel is uh, by his Twitter feed. If you don't know who he is, you're going to know who he is in thorough detail by the end of this. Um, he's in the backdrop. Let me just make sure that we are currently live everywhere. We're live on Rumble. Let me refresh and just make sure. Okay, it looks good. Looks good. Okay, it is good, but now I'm getting an ad. Sorry, hold on one second. Okay, so we're good on Rumble. We're good on vivabarnslaw.locals.com standard disclaimers though probably won't come up anytime today no medical advice no legal advice no election fortification advice you all know how the support works vivabarnslaw.locals.com is our locals platform you can get merch at viva fry all that other stuff super chats uh rumble rants we've got a viva barns law uh locals community thing going on right now so i'll get to some questions that the community has for chef gruel um but not to waste too much of an intro time chef andrew gruel is in the house if you don't know who he is, you're going to know who he is. Chef, I'm bringing you in in three, two, one. Sir, how goes the battle? Uh, it goes. We're battling. <laughs> oh, God. I, I've been boning up on your podcast. Like I, I knew enough about you. You read Wikipedia. It gives you the basics. Uh, I listened to your podcast on Ruben or your interview with Dave Ruben from 2021. And what's amazing is listening to these things two years down the line, uh, much of what was, you know, it ages very well, depending on what side of the blue pill, red pill divide you are on. Uh, listen to on Eliza Blue. Uh, in, 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 interesting stuff. So I know, I think I know everything about you that you've publicly disclosed, but we're going to get into a little more today. Um, before we even get into it, let me make sure what I'm thinking about here. Uh, now we'll get to where people can find you at the end of this, but everyone's going to know. Uh, who are you? 30,000 foot overview. And I hope you know that I like to delve into childhood to understand the present adult. But wh who are you for those who don't know? Hey, I'm America's chef. Uh, I, I'm a chef and culinarian. Uh, I've been on various TV shows, Food Network, FYI Network. But right now I own Calico Fish House in Huntington Beach, California. 
I previously owned Slapfish, which was a 28 unit fast casual chain that I started as a food truck back in 2011 and grew to a franchise. And now we're just doing it all over again. Uh, well, actually, we're going to break all that down because one thing that's fascinating, you know, there's the there's the culinary side of being a chef and then there's the business side. And I, I, having been a lawyer, uh, you know, dealt with chefs, restaurants and franchises, it's, it's a very complicated thing that you're going to have to flesh out for us. First question first, I think I know the answer, but chef, your last name is Gruel, real or fake? Hey, that's real. It was a calling, you know, everybody. That's the that's where people trash me on Twitter. Why would I trust a chef named Gruel? But the thing is, I make the best <laughs> darn porridge that you could ever have. And I promise you that. I remember the day when the word of the day on Wordle was gruel. And then you tweeted out, I'm, I'm today's Wordle. Uh, yep. Word for those who didn't get it back then. Uh, okay, so let, let's let's back it up all the way to the childhood. Gruel as a last name is of Germanic origin, if I'm not mistaken. And I think it actually means victorious of Germanic origins. Um, where I mean, you're from New Jersey. Where are your parents from? How long have you been in America for? What's What's childhood like? Yeah, so I'm from New Jersey originally. Both my parents, we grew up in Jersey. My my father, the name Gruel is German. So uh, I, I actually grew up speaking uh, German. My father was stationed in Germany as well in the U.S. Army. And now my mother's side of the family is all Italian. So I'm half Italian, half German. So my family was from Staten Island, the Italian side of it. So obviously we've got that, that culinary side with the Italian piece of it. But, uh, you know, I'll tell you, childhood wise, I actually grew up, I was a latchkey child, right? So I did not have those gourmet dinners and I don't have the stories of rolling pasta with my grandmothers. I grew up on Sara Lee and anything that could fit into a microwave. I actually thought that eggs were microwaved until I was about 13 years old. So, uh, uh, you know, for me to end up in the culinary industry is pretty funny to the whole family. What does a latchkey child mean? It means both my parents worked all day, every day, um, you know, so I was you know, kind of fending for myself while, while they were hardworking, hardworking parents trying to, you know, do, do what they do and give us a good upbringing, my sister and I. So uh, I cooked a lot at home as a result of that. That was the trouble that I got into. So two kids in the family, you and your sister. Yep. And uh, parents still alive? Yep. Both, both still alive, still in Jersey. Uh, mother still working, father retired. And uh, my dad spends his uh, winters in Florida. Uh, so that, uh, that's my Florida connection. And, and uh, let me ask you this, if I may, what, what did your father do? What does your mother do? Did they do the same thing uh, throughout their lives or did they bounce around jobs? Yeah, my dad, you know, it was funny. My dad actually was a finance guy. He went to college, got his, uh, he got his MBA. And then, well, after getting his MBA, he got drafted to Vietnam and, uh, you know, was like, well, you know, I'm going to go and d do my, pa t my patriotic service and uh, was supposed to go to Vietnam. And at the last second, as they were all actually going to board planes, turns out there was a finance officer who was uh, either moving up or being promoted or retiring out at a base in Germany. And my dad went from got pulled off the line and ended up in Germany um, doing doing finance with the troops out there as a result of uh, his educational background. So narrowly missed, uh, you know, a bullet there, pun intended. And my mother is an urban and then he ended up in finance uh, specifically um, as a in, on the corporate side of things. My mother is an urban planner. She started her own firm. Uh, so she does urban planning, design development. She's she was a pro, she's a professor as well as owning her own firm at Rutgers University. And uh, so we grew up looking at curb cuts and parking lot designs. OK, that's very interesting. So your dad was drafted to Nam. This is you're born in 1980. So this is before yeah. either of the children were born. Ends up yep. in Germany. Uh, mm -hmm. For how many years was he in Germany? Two years. All right. And then growing up was he didn't serve any more growing up. He wasn't away from home for that reason. Growing up, it was it was work between your parents. Yep. It was work between the parents. Exactly. You know, my dad had a uh, he was an inner city kid, uh, pretty rough upbringing. So for him, it was about, you know, working his butt off and always trying to provide for us. So, you know, they worked, they were around as much as possible, obviously. But, uh, you know, they were hardworking parents. And how many generations American? I'm always fascinated by this. Like how far back can you trace your family in the States? Uh, so my grandfather did come over from Italy um, when when my right before my mother was born. So they were just, you know, she was the first generation in America coming over from Italy. And uh, my father from their side from Germany, I think, was probably about the same. OK. And Germany, as in the Germanic side, not the not the Jewish side of, of Germany, of those who fled uh, during the war before the war. Correct. Correct. OK, fascinating. Two kids. 
parents are out the entire time. You're getting you're you're the level of which you get into trouble consists uh, of in the house where you you were not a troublemaker as a kid, not getting into trouble in school. Um, just uh, pr pretty, uh, I say not ordinary, but trouble free, except for the hell that you were raising in the house. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, you know, I was a class clown, but that, other than that, you know, I, uh, I, I, I enjoyed academics to some degree and was into sports and athletics, but, uh, you know, for me, it was, I always tell this story. I used to actually, as dorky as this sounds, I would skip school not to go party, but I would stay at home and I would watch like the old uh, PBS cooking shows, kind of those dump and stir cooking shows, Yan Khan Cook and Julia Child and Jacques Pepin. And I would try and recreate that in the kitchen at home. My mother would sometimes come home early on, uh, you know, a little surprise visit, perhaps a meeting or she wasn't testifying um, in the nighttime, which is what she would do. Right. Daytime was working. Nighttime, she would go and represent these cities and, you know, testimony about how they're redeveloping their cities, their, you know, kind of the city structure and, uh, um, you know, the plans. And uh, she would just find you know, butter wall to wall or, you know, small fires on the stove. And, and that was my trouble. All right. No, I, and I ask only to like, you know, try to understand how those who have become sort of vocal critics against the system as adults, what they were like as kids. And I compare it to my life and say, you know, I, I project that everyone had to have been a, a hellraiser, uh, rebellious, troublemaker, problem child to have grown up to be, you know, what were uh, what was a liability as a child growing up becomes an asset in terms of critical thinking as an adult if you can make it through relatively unscathed. Uh, 1980, so you're 43 years old. Uh, public school in Jersey? Uh, public school and then private school. Um, because I was getting in a little bit of trouble and my parents, uh, my dad knew the admissions director. He actually had served with him at a local private school. And uh, it was funny because... I was a bit of an outsider going to private school where we were from. There was a private school near there, but most of the kids came from a real rich area of New Jersey to be, you know, driven in by their private drivers to this private school. So I absolutely hated it. Um, I was into punk rock and skateboarding and all of that. So I was a bit rebellious at that point. And then when they told me I had to go to private school, that was just way too troublesome for me. Um, and, uh, so I got to understand authority pretty well, but I also, there was a deep honor code at our, at our private school, which I appreciate now looking back on it. And, uh, you know, that, that kind of honor code and that moral compass that they built out for us has stayed with me for years. And, uh, not, not a religious private school. It was not, it was not religious. However, I was an altar boy for many years. I grew up Roman Catholic and, uh, was very involved in the local church community. Okay. Fascinating. Now you fast forward a little bit. Uh, I mean, people always ask how you get, how someone gets into becoming a chef, you know, there, there's culinary school. Um, and then there's sort of, uh, the, the other way around, which is sort of accidental for some, uh, what, what did you study after high school? How did you get into the world of, of, of being a chef cooking? Well, it's, that is a funny story. So I actually was, you know, get it. You got to get a job when you're 14, 15. So one of the first jobs that I got, um, was in host, uh, restaurants, right? So, that was my high school job. I absolutely loved it. I loved the fast pace of the restaurant industry. I loved food. My dad was involved with an org with AAA, right? So that was who we worked for. And they did a lot of rating of restaurants. So we kind of understood that growing up. And I, tra I did travel with my dad a bit for some of his business trips and got to love food. Um, and uh, so that was why I was like, oh, I want to work in restaurants. And then ultimately worked at some finer dining restaurants before I went away to college. I went to a small liberal arts college up in Maine. It was called Bates College. Um, it's like 1,700 students. And my major was actually piano performance and philosophy. So that's what I was studying for the first two years of that I was there. While I was there, having, you know, naturally you get to college, your parents are like, you got to still get a job. You got to pay. And I was also an athlete. I was a runner, distance runner. And I uh, started working at Lobster Docks, um, working in various restaurants along the coast of Maine. And this ultimately does come full circle to my to my concept. But uh, after about a year or two, I realized I was spending way too much time working and in kitchens than I was in class. My grades started to go down. I ended up quitting running. But it wasn't because I was screwing around, although I was a little bit. But I was just so involved in the restaurant industry. So naturally, I said, I'm not going to waste any money or time here. And I'm just going to completely immerse myself in restaurants. And I left college. I actually hitchhiked from Maine out to Wyoming. I got a job with the Grand Teton Lodge Company over the summer of my soft, what would have been going into my junior year in college. And uh, I worked for the Grand Teton Lodge Company as a chef out there. 
after hitchhiking from Maine to Wyoming or Montana, rather, actually, I went to Montana first and then took a bus down. And after that, it was, you know, it was then I got the full bite, ended up doing my apprenticeship out in Oregon. And then I went back to school to get my culinary arts degree and then ultimately my food service uh, business management and food marketing degree. Uh, how, how old are you when you're hitchhiking across the country? Uh, 1920. Uh, I don't know if your parents are anything like mine. Were they terrified? Were they absolutely opposed to this? Did they realize, you know, if they love you, they have to let you go type thing? Because I think my parents would probably kill me before letting me do that back in the day. They didn't know about any of this. Now they do. But at the time, they just thought I was taking that I was taking, you know, taking a train across the country to get my job. They knew that I had a job. I had that lined up. And, uh, you know, so everything in between was, you know, a bit improv improvisation. And uh, Grand Teton's the most beautiful place on earth or tied with other places? Oh, I mean, Grand Teton's was amazing. I got out there working there in April. Um, and you know, it says the snow, the snow is melting and it's the, you know, spring is turning into summer before the tourist season hits. I mean, it was the greatest summer of my life and, uh, it was absolutely amazing. It truly, truly was. It is the most beautiful place. One of the most beautiful places in America. We talk a lot. I see it on social media, people posting about how we don't take advantage of our national parks enough. And it, it, it is, that is a true, cause there, there's a, there's a kind of a, an environmental blessing. I, I, you know, and I, you know, it's funny. I was into specifically environmental literature and environmentalism, and I, I hitchhiked across the country to try and, do, you know, become the, my own Jack Kerouac, if you will, or Edward Abbey, what have you, any of these kind of 60s, 70s environmentally focused beat writers. And I absolutely loved it. And that's actually been the cornerstone of my business has really been this environmental push. I just got done at an ACC conference, which is the American Conservation Coalition, and it's all about free market environmentalism. So I've made that a big piece of my platform now kind of on a go forward basis, because I still consider myself an environmentalist, although there seems to be some dissonance there because you can't be a libertarian or you can't be free minded and also be an environmentalist, according to many people on Twitter. Yeah, we're, we're, we, we are. Gonna, there's, a, there's a few questions in terms of uh, the environmentalist side about, um, you know, uh, getting meats from from what do they call them? Responsible sources, which we're going to get to because I have a list of questions from locals that we're going to we're going to get to. Um, so you spend the summer in 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 the Grand in Wyoming, Grand Tetons. Uh, then you go back and you get, what is it? Is it called a culinary degree, a, a chef's degree? Well, first it was an apprenticeship, right? So you've got, ultimately, you can either go to culinary school or you can do your apprenticeship. And the apprenticeship is where you actually work under, uh, you know, a world-renowned chef or, a, a, you know, just a classically trained chef. And you learn the basics, the fundamentals. It's the same thing that you would learn in culinary school. And it's all that kind of classic French brigade system, sauces, soups the foundations of cooking, your mother's sauces, all classic French, a Scoffier style. Um, so I did that for, for uh, a while at a, uh, actually it was the, the hotel was Timberline Lodge and it was, an, it was like a Swiss master chef. Timberline Lodge is where they actually filmed the exterior shots from The Shining. On the top of Mount Hood, uh, it's the only place in North America where there's actually skiing year round because of the glacier that sits on the front of it. So I lived up there uh, and worked like 80 hours a week lived in a little cabin at the base of the mountain. I would, uh, I would go out, hitchhike to work in the morning with my snowboard. And then I would get off work and this was like 6 AM. And then I would get off work at 10 PM and I would actually put a headlamp on and I would snowboard through the trees all the way down the mountain home every single day. So it was the coolest experience in the world while I was going through this education. Well, damn it. Now I'm ex actually extremely, extremely jealous at that visual. Uh, yeah. uh, okay. Amazing. So you, you, the apprenticeship is, is how long does it take to get, I mean, and not to say credentials matter, but like, the, do you get an official recognition accreditation after this apprenticeship that allows you to then say, I've, I've done this and I'm, I'm certified ish. Yeah, you can, you can, mine wasn't, uh, an accredited, um, apprenticeship because I knew I ultimately did want to go back and transfer my college credits to get the full bachelor's and get the degree and then ultimately go back to business school at some point. So for me, it was more about just the, you know, it's kind of, you, you do the apprenticeship, you learn the system, you work your way through the restaurant, through the brigade, if you will, from kind of dishwasher to saucier to young um, chef de partie, which is like a banquet assistant, and then ultimately through the line, dining service, breakfast, you name it. I mean, it's every single aspect. You don't necessarily learn the formal business aspects of it, but it's all hands-on culinary, the artistry of it. Okay, excellent. And then you go then afterwards to get a business degree. 
Yeah, then I moved to Denver. Denver, uh, the Johnson Wales University, which is one of the large Johnson Wales University and CIA are the two largest culinary accredited culinary institutes and colleges in the United States. So I wanted to stay stick around, kind of in the mountainous region. So I went to Denver. The J JU Law Campus turned into Johnson and Wales, um, or the DU Law Campus turned into Johnson and Wales. It was like the third year the new culinary school was open. So I went there, transferred my credits, and got my culinary degree while simultaneously working um, and almost continuing forward in my apprenticeship, but more of kind of an internship with a certified master chef in Colorado. So there was only at the time about 50 certified master chefs in the world, uh, which is a formal accreditation program. And I worked under one of them, uh, one of the few in the United States for two and a half years while I was going to school. Okay, phenomenal. And now, I don't know what, what age we're at here. We're about 22, 23 years old. Yeah, 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 roughly. Um, so you, 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 culinary school. I, people imagine you, you go, you learn what types of foods mix with what, what. I mean, what type of training actually goes into the school? What types of classes do you have? How fascinating is it for anybody who's thinking about it? Or is it, is it tedious and there's a lot of basic stuff and then a lot of technical stuff? Yes. Yeah, so I came at it from an, from, from an experience that I already had a lot of culinary skill. Now, I did it backwards, right? So I didn't understand intellectually the fundamentals of what I was doing, but I could understand how to make all of these things. And I had muscle memory in the kitchen and I understood the systems. So I was a bit older um, and I was transferring credits, right? So this was the coolest experience in the world for me because I loved what I was doing and I knew this is what I wanted to do. I was in there with some people who are a bit older than I was, who had, this was a second career. And then a lot of young kids and the young kids who went to culinary school, you know, they, they didn't appreciate it. They didn't appreciate what they were getting into. Their parents wanted them to go there. They wanted to become the next Food Network star. Um, so it was a real mix of people. But what I tell people now is, is that don't go to culinary school until you've actually gotten some kitchen experience and some real world experience because you'll appreciate it a lot more and it will actually make sense. It's not all just kind of book smarts. So for me, having had all of this experience and then going to this brand new culinary school, it was the, it was the most amazing thing in the world because you have the top of the line equipment on absolutely everything, you know, and you'll spend a full course, which would be, it was 12 weeks just doing meat cutting, right? So bringing in primals, understanding meat cutting, chicken, lamb, everything from that perspective. Then you'll do a 12 week block on just sauces and soups. So you'll learn all the mother sauces Then you'll do a 12 week block. on. Hold on stop, stop, stop. What is it? What does a mother sauce mean? A mother sauce are the foundation of all classic French sauces, sauces, right? So bechamel, espagnol, um, tomato sauce, hollandaise, velouté, and demi-glace, right? So every single French sauce is a derivative of one of those sauces. When Escoffier wrote his culinary Bible, he started with the mother sauces, and then he would he did sauce like 27, and that was, you know, demi-glace, which is basically a classic rich beef gravy with a little bit of tomato in it. And then the next sauce, sauce 232, it was numbers. So you actually had to memorize thousands of sauces and then put the spin on each one of these sauces. That's how Escoffier, the grandfather of cooking, taught all of his young cooks. And in kitchens all the way up until the 1970s or 80s before Hout Cuisine took over, everything was a foundation of Escoffier's Bible of cooking. Okay, that is so cool. Okay, that's amazing. You learn the basics now, cutting meat. And, you know, I, 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 there is a science to it. We started off this video with breaking down a tuna. That's just breaking yeah. it down into its components. And then in terms of like, there's a science behind the grain depending on what, how you're going to cook it, how thick. I mean, uh, can there be anything more fascinating if you're into this than studying uh, your passion? I mean, how, how cool? Let me, let me back that question up. What does a class look like? People love this or are there, like every other class, people who are bored, they don't want to be there uh, and don't appreciate how beautiful what they're learning actually is? Yeah, both, right? So you have people who appreciate it and, and then and you've got, you know, kind of the rich, spoiled kids whose parents told them they had to go there. And, you know, they're just trying to sell dime bags on the side. This was, uh, you know, for me, it was just an unbelievable experience. And I appreciate every single second of it. I was, I, you know, I was, I was a, a, a brown noser. I, I spent more time with the chef instructors than I did with anybody else at the school. Because you've got the best equipment out there in the industry, right? Like your uniform, your shoes, your knife kit, everything is the absolute best of the best. And I knew that this was something that one, I hadn't experienced because even when I was work, doing my apprenticeship and working in other kitchens, it was, you know, you're trying to create food off of broken burners and equipment that's half functional, 
So to have the best of the best, I knew that that wasn't reality. So I definitely enjoyed it and kind of soaked it up. But, you know, we, we there were two class blocks, right? So class, the AM block was 6 AM until 2.30 PM. And then the, the later half was 3 PM until 9 or 10 PM, right? So I used to do the 6 AM till 2.30. And then I had my job that started at 3. And I would work from 3 until 11 PM. And then I would drive an hour home and then turn around and do it the next day again at 6 a.m. So for a 21, 22, 23 year old, you know, that was hard work, right? Everybody's going out and partying. And they're just taking one class. I was working 60 hours a week alongside going to school full time. So for me, this was a lot of work. Um, it, it was a push. Fascinating. Uh, it ends with a degree. What do you do after you graduate? So I left uh, I left my the job that I was running. I ultimately worked my way up to Chef de Cuisine underneath this certified master chef. And then it was kind of time for him to release me into the wild. I ended up going back and working for the Ritz Carlton in Boston, the original old school Ritz Carlton right on the Boston Common. Absolutely gorgeous. I was an East Coast guy, Yankees fan. So maybe I wasn't in friendly territory in Boston, but I, uh, I went and worked in um, Boston uh, for the Ritz Carlton for a couple of years into one year of doing that, I decided that, you know, 80 hours a week working at the Ritz Carlton wasn't enough. So I actually would commute four days a week. Um, and then I would still work full time Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And then I went back and got my business degree at the uh, in Providence at the college there. How many years did you do that for? Uh, I did that for a year. I was able to get the business degree in a year. Amazing. Okay. And now, so look, we know that you, you got into, well, we're going to skip ahead to the franchise, but I don't think we, we can. What, what happens in between you're now give or take 26 years old. Yep. Uh, 26. And what do you do for the next decade of your life? Well, so at, tw so after I was, got my business degree, then I was deciding what I wanted to do. I was still cooking at the Ritz on the side and my brother's brother, my brother-in-law's brother owned a coffee shop and a cafe up in New Hampshire. And he was trying to expand his kitchen and he had booked a ton of catering and his chef quit on him. So he called me and he said, can you work for me for two weeks, pull my kitchen together, get my business and books together and blow out this catering season going into summer. So I went up there one summer turned into a little bit over a year and we opened up another two restaurants connected with his shop. So that was my first foray into being an entrepreneur where we were actually opening and running restaurants and, go and growing a, a, a business from a coffee shop into a large restaurant group. We were named the, the best bistro by Boston Globe. Um, we really put that restaurant on the map from a culinary perspective. So I did that for about a year and a half. And, uh, and then I went back to New Jersey and got, got back in the corporate scene, worked for Marriott as a corporate executive chef for a while. I had to get back to Jersey. I knew I needed to. And um, I knew I wanted a taste of the corporate side. So I did that for a couple of years. Um, and then in 2007, six or seven, I took a job, uh, in Asbury park, New Jersey. I was a big music guy, still am love punk rock, loved the, the kind of, you know, the old Brinks, Bruce Springsteen element of New Jersey and in Asbury park, which had become a complete dump, they got bought out by a redeveloper and they decided that they were going to redo the old Howard Johnson's hotel and restaurant right on the Asbury park boardwalk, iconic building. So I came in as the chef to redo that restaurant which then we grew to a couple large restaurants into 2007, 2008. When the economy tanked in 2007, actually, I remember it was like October 12th, 2007, the restaurant company I was working for downsized and I lost my job, never lost my job before ever. Um, and I was actually going to go and open my own restaurant, but I was waiting for the economy to find some footing. So I got headhunted for, this is, this is crazy, right? So I have a culinary arts degree. I have a business food service management degree, and I have another degree in food marketing I got, right? They were, and my passion was sustainability and environmentalism. That, that was the foundation of my food for the previous five years was working with local farmers and understanding our food systems. I got an opportunity to start a nonprofit sustainable seafood program at the Aquarium of the Pacific. It was a three-year grant from the Pacific Life Foundation, and the focus was actually getting consumers and Americans to eat more well-managed, sustainable seafood. The way in which they wanted it done, because 80% of the seafood consumed in California was done so in restaurants, was to bring in a chef who had a marketing degree to educate other chefs about how to serve sustainable seafood, what it means, and they were looking.
looking for a chef with a business degree, a marketing background and a, and restaurant experience, which seemed perfect. Right. So I took this opportunity and to run this grant, it was like a $600,000 grant, um, for three years. And ultimately after doing that for three years and working throughout California, understanding the restaurant industry and the seafood industry, I said, the reason people aren't eating enough seafood is because on the one end of the spectrum, you've got fine dining seafood. On the other end of the spectrum, you've got greasy fried seafood. But there's nothing in the middle that combines that quality of fine dining with the cost and convenience of fast food because consumers are cons concerned and confused about what sustainable seafood is. So I, I launched this business idea called Slapfish, fish so fresh it'll slap you. I tried to raise money for it. Nobody would give me any money coming out of that recession. So I actually went down to a local food truck lot. This was before food trucks were the thing, before they were cool. And I paid, there was this, you know, these guys that would drive around to construction lots. I said, how much do you make in a week? They said, we make about $800 a week. I said, okay, I'm going to give you $900. I'm going to take your food truck. And I'm going to drive around to college campuses. And I'm going to sell lobster rolls because I still had these connections from college to get fresh lobster. I'm going to sell lobster rolls and fish tacos. And if it works and I make more than $900 a week to cover the, you know, to cover the nut for these guys, then I'm going to do it for another week. So that was the, that was the birth of Slapfish, um, which then I went from one to five food trucks over a five month period. And then I ended up um, bootstrapping for my first brick and mortar six months later. And then in four years, we had 10 restaurants. And then in eight years, we had 23 restaurants. That's and then we fascinating. Now, I don't know if I'm allowed to ask this, but I'm going to ask it here. Then we're going to go over to Rumble exclusively and just end this on YouTube. Uh, you get a $600,000 grant for three years. What are the, yep. like, what, what, I mean, I, obviously you can't just take that $600,000 and, and pay yourself. So what, what are the metrics when you get that type of a grant in terms of, uh, metrics of success, guidelines of you know guidelines or requirements in terms of how you disperse those funds or invest them. And before you answer that, ending on YouTube, people, come on over to Rumble in three. Two, the the link to Rumble is in the pinned comment of the chat on YouTube. We're going to get an answer to this question, and we're getting into the sustainability stuff, and then we're going to get into the politics.